weekend of my uh, past speaking experiences here and discovered that on April 5th, 1990, I had been uh, not in this conference room, but another one down here. And I suspect uh, uh, Nick Hamming wandered in at the end of it, but uh, he wasn't there for the whole talk. Uh, there's probably nobody here who heard me uh, on that occasion. So I will uh, come fresh to you, most of you, um, as someone who has been tilting at windmills for most of his professional life, trying to develop systems that were significantly better than what one can acquire off the shelf. Um, and yet we're living in a world where increasingly not only customers, ordinary customers, but U.S. government and U.S. defense institutions are forced to buy off the shelf stuff, hardware, software, whatever it is. Uh, this is quite different from the way things were many years ago when the government believed that it could special order uh, a large number of systems, uh, one of a kind systems, and uh, make it work. Now, in recent years, we've seen some colossal uh, expenditures of funds. The IRS has recently uh, realized that it's thrown $4 billion down the rat hole and uh, canceled the entire modernization effort um, as it had been conceived. The air traffic control situation after a decade of development of a particular system uh, got to the point where it was clear that system wasn't going to ever meet its specifications and that effort was canceled. The um, uh, National Crime Information Center, NCIC, has just uh, decommissioned a uh, fingerprint analysis system that uh, it thought would uh, be the leap into the modern world. So we have this history of uh, those examples which are government systems, but also a lot of uh, commercial uh, products where the systems simply did not live up to their expectations. And they were either uh, decommissioned or canceled or have fallen by the wayside one way or another. Now, with that sort of a picture as background, um, I wanted to spend a little time with you today looking at some of the reasons why systems fail with the particular emphasis on the systems themselves, namely looking at the systems in the large. And I think the, uh, the essence of what I want to say is that all too often we see uh, analyses of algorithms or analyses of programs or uh, patches put into systems in the small without realizing the global implications. In the past few years, we've seen, uh, well, wait, let's go way back to 1980, since uh, most of you are uh, not, uh, we're not around in those days uh, in the way we are now. In 1980, we had uh, the entire Arcanet going belly up for four hours. As a result of what looked like a very local event, a couple of bits were dropped in one of the nodes. Now, the way the ARPANET worked then, the way the internet still tends to work now, each minute, each node would propagate to its neighbors its status. And at the end of, uh, in those days, eight or nine minutes, every node in the network had some sort of a picture of what was working and what wasn't. If the node wasn't working, they, were, they didn't try to send any traffic. Now, the problem was that not only were a couple of status messages corrupted, but uh, those status messages had the highest priority of all the messages that were flying around the internet, uh, the ARPANET, rather. And uh, there was a garbage collection algorithm that was supposed to uh, get rid of all of the old status messages. Unfortunately, with a couple of bit drops, uh, there were three versions of the same message in which version one was more recent than version two, which was more recent than version three, which, because the algorithm wasn't very good, 
uh, was more recent than version one. So none of these status messages could be dropped. Everything was kept. Memory overflowed in every single node, and the entire network collapsed. It took hours to diagnose the problem and uh, manually uh, reinitialize everything. Uh, ten years later, we had a very similar experience with the AT&T long lines outage, where for nine or 11 hours, depending on who you talk to, uh, essentially nobody was getting long distance traffic. So this was Martin Luther King Day in uh, 1990. And um, again, a single problem in a single node propagated throughout the entire network. The result of which was that each node in the network kept crashing. Every few seconds it would crash, it would go through its recovery cycle, start broadcasting traffic. <coughs> uh, the result was that all of the neighbors would crash. And again, a little while later, all of their neighbors would crash. So in a sense, it's exactly the same mechanism. Now, last summer, we saw the power failure situation, where um, on July 2nd, a tree that uh, allegedly hit a high-tension wire in uh, Idaho uh, caused a 10-state outage. Uh, there's an interesting side story on that. Uh, somebody who works for the Federal Bureau of Investigation apparently gave a talk at uh, University of California, Davis, a few weeks ago, and claimed uh, that, in fact, uh, this was an act of espionage, that uh, the story of, uh, of uh, the fact that it was attributed to a tree was, in fact, a cover-up. Now, whatever that's worth, we're on tape. That's, that's uh, for the record. Um, you can go back to your friendly uh, uh, bureau and ask them to deny the story, which they will, of course, do. And all I can tell you is that uh, this statement was made in a public lecture at uh, Davis. Um, now, there's an interesting problem in terms of what is accidental and what is intentional. And if we go back to the ARPANET collapse of 1980, uh, we discover that it would have been possible for Cynthia from her own computer to have brought down the network by doing effectively uh, a triggering of the identical events that led to the collapse of the network. Uh, since all of the um, nodes in the network were maintained from Cambridge by BBN uh, using a fairly unprotected uh, access path to all of the nodes, uh, it would have been very easy to do that. Ten years later, in the at and class, um, there was a, uh, a report uh, about how this was a flaw in the recovery software. Uh, I got a call two days later from a couple of uh, hacker types that I'd met at the National Computer Security Conference in Baltimore uh, two months before. And they wanted to know whether I'd heard anything about uh, AT&T blaming them because they claimed they were on the switch when the first switch crashed. Now, how do you know? Uh, it could have been that they accidentally uh, crashed just the first switch that then propagated to all the others. They certainly weren't responsible for the software flaw that, uh, that caused the, uh, the outage. But uh, there's a very fine line between what can be done, or maybe there's not such a fine line, between what can be done uh, intentionally and what can happen. Accidentally, and I think if you look through the uh, uh, list of problems that I have, uh, I have a few handouts left, and uh, I'll give you a, um, a web page uh, if you want to uh, pull this thing off uh, on a website at the very bottom there. Um, Illustrative.postscript is a file that contains several thousand uh, or some thousand cases of things that have gone wrong. If you look through that, you see quite a few of those cases where something that's seemingly accidental, um, that occurred seemingly accidentally, could in fact have been triggered intentionally. I'll give you a simple example of some of the uh, electronic voting machines. Uh, one classical example 
was the case where the test that was done before the election ballot counting um, was run and everything seemed to work in order. So then they proceeded to tabulate the votes. The only thing is they forgot to zero out the test results. So all of the test results got added on to the election results and in fact reversed the, uh, the results. Now, it was claimed that that was an accident. Right? Oh, that's never going to happen again. We made a mistake. We'll, we'll never do it again. Everything's just fine. Don't worry about a thing. Trust us. Uh, the system is, is intrinsically sound. Uh, how do you know? Well, the answer is you don't. So the message that I'm sort of leaning toward here, and I'll go through a, a couple more examples, uh, is that you have to look at the whole system. Another set of examples involve air traffic control outages. Uh, there was one event where a single cable cut brought down all three New York airports. That shouldn't happen. We now have to design systems that are redundant, fault tolerant, able to withstand failures in some robust way. Um, six years after the ARPANET collapse, uh, the folks who were involved in making sure that New England remained on the ARPANET had specified that they wanted seven different links from New York to Boston. So that if one of those links went down, there would still be ARPANET connectivity from New England. But fortunately, all seven of those links went through the same cable. <laughs> and a single cable cut in white plays brought down New England from the ARPANET. Um, a couple of years later, the uh, Associated Press, UPI, and other news services had specified that they wanted two separate cables in the Annandale, Virginia area, so that they would have redundancy. Even if one cable was cut, the other cable would be there. A single backhoe went through both cables. So here we have this notion of we're designing a system, we're putting in redundancy, we're putting in all tolerance, we're putting in good software engineering, maybe. We'll come back to that later. And we're putting in security. And we suddenly discover that the system is vulnerable to all sorts of events, whether they are malicious attacks or accidental misbehavior or acts of God. Uh, we have the classical case of the uh, Wallops Island missile launch site, where they were trying to study the effects of lightning on the missile launch process. And so they had a bunch of missiles armed and ready to go to be launched the next time there was a lightning storm. Unfortunately, lightning hit the missile launch platform and launched one of the missiles. Now, how do you anticipate things like that. When you're designing a system, you normally like to say, we're going to write requirements that cover all reasonable possible situations. What can go wrong? Well, I submit to you that most of the requirements that you find are hopelessly inevitable. They leave out most of the real threats. There are lots of systems that have been designed with no security with the feeling, well, we can add that later problems. Uh, the internet is such a beast. Uh, the ARPANET has no, had no security, but the internet has basically no security from the networking point of view. It relies on the host systems that are connected to the internet to be secure. But most of them aren't. Most of them are seriously vulnerable. And then we say, well, we're going to put in a firewall. And that's going to solve the problem because we're, we're protected. And we're now behind the firewall. Our connection to the internet is protected. Except the firewalls are semi permeable. They're not firewalls at all. They're fire sponges or fire, uh, fire Swiss cheeses with all the holes connected. Um, and then we have all these web servers and web browsers and programming languages. Java and ActiveX are examples. Uh, some of those are vastly more vulnerable than others. But they're all potentially vulnerable. 
And the attitude is, well, we don't have to worry about security. We'll just put this stuff out and everything's going to be fine. Because what we're trying to do is to create an open environment where everybody can read everything that's on the web page. And then we discovered that the CIA and the Justice Department and the Air Force and NASA have all had their websites hacked in the past few months. Right? Now, what does it matter if your only requirement is confidentiality? What have you done? You've forgotten about integrity. The integrity of the website is important. And when you all of a sudden have really nasty, bogus stuff flying around on your website, you forgot something. Maybe you forgot the integrity requirement or the denial of service prevention requirement. So we're in a situation where basically the infrastructure that we're dealing with is pretty weak. Um, there are a lot of people who will probably tell you that they have solutions to these problems. Uh, the firewall vendors will tell you the firewalls will solve your problem. Uh, the honest firewall vendors will tell you that firewalls help a little bit if they're properly administered and if they're properly implemented and if they're even properly designed, which some of them aren't. And so you say, okay, well, we'll put in a firewall. And now you say, well, let's use encryption. That doesn't, that's all. Well, a lot of the encryption that we see is built on operating systems that are not only semi-permeable, they are totally permeable. And maybe the keys are stored in the, in the operating system. And so essentially all of that cryptography is at stake. Furthermore, we have all this business of, of how vulnerable 40-bit crypto is. So we say, well, let's go to 128-bit uh, crypto, except the vendors won't put it in because they can't export it for another reason. And, uh, and maybe that's all irrelevant anyway. If you think <coughs> about some of the uh, potentially theoretical results, but maybe potentially practical results of the past year, uh, it all began with, with Paul Kocher, who discovered that by essentially observing the behavior of a uh, public key crypto implementation, effectively whether it's exponentiating or whether it's shifting, uh, you can derive the private key from external observation. Um, then along came Ross Anderson in England, who showed that he could trick smart cards into essentially disgorging all of their master keys uh, without too much effort. And then there was the result of, of Bonnie DeMello and Lipton at uh, Belcor, who showed that, in fact, by injecting a little noise into a public key uh, crypto algorithm, uh, they could derive the private key by essentially doing a differential attack between the correct version and the slightly false version. And then uh, BM and Shamir in Israel came along and said they could do the same thing for DES and triple DES. The key length doesn't matter. You can still break the algorithm. Okay, the lesson of all of this is you got to look at the big picture. The guy who has the crypto solution is like the man with a hammer. To him, everything looks like a nail. Uh, I guess to me, with, with a book on, on risks, uh, everything looks like a risk. Uh, basically, when I, when I look at the system, all I see is the vulnerability. Now, I will certainly never deny that there's some wonderful software out there. There's some absolutely beautiful systems out there. But if you look at it from the jaundiced point of view of what are the vulnerabilities, what are the risks, what are the realistic threats that we must deal with, um, I, I take a, a much dimmer view of stuff that looks absolutely wonderful. For example, all of the web browsers are marvelous from the point of view of what they can do, function. From a security point of view, it's not a matter. Uh, some of the um, PC operating systems, 
They look great from the point of view of what they used to be if you compare them to their predecessors. Uh, but if you look at the fact that they're crashing all the time, or they're, they're totally not secure, um, not very encouraging. Now the real question then is how can we look at systems in the large? There's a tremendous body of information in the software engineering community which has been going on for almost 30 years now. And there's all sorts of stuff on object-oriented programming and strong typing and, and uh, the separation of duties and separation of privileges and abstraction and encapsulation and, and object-oriented uh, polymorphism and, and uh, uh, inheritance and all these marvelous things. Um, except that they are not used very consistently in real-life systems. And even if they are, there are some serious problems in assuring that the system is not compromisable for totally different reasons. I've seen a lot of systems, including telephone switches, where effectively every node in the network has the same password, which happens to be the, the maintenance password that is used by all the folks who are maintaining the system. And there was one uh, uh, investigation that I did in the evaluation of the system I found uh, this to be the case. And I told the, uh, the folks about it. And I said, it doesn't do any good to change the password because they just change it right back to what it was because that's the only one they can remember. So uh, we have a situation where you may be using wonderful software engineering techniques and you may be throwing out the baby with the bathwater because the operational procedures are lame. So from the system viewpoint that I am proposing here, uh, we really need to be able to grapple with the system in the large. And I think this is the biggest challenge. Um, if you look at the research community, there's a lot of work in the small. Most of the research is in the small. Most of the education is in the small. It's very hard to look at the big picture. From the research point of view, there is there are a few little pieces of, of research in the security community. Or what happens if you put one subsystem together with another subsystem? Uh, there's research that works in the modeling area, for example, of what happens to the security properties if you compose a system out of subsystems. But all of this work tends to be done in the small. And to get an idea of the big picture, what happens when you put together two big subsystems? I have these two absolutely wonderful, hypothetical, secure systems, and I'm going to put them together with a straight wire in which the password goes in the clear, fixed password in the clear between the two very secure systems. Is this a secure environment? Clearly not. Uh, if there's any way of, of tapping that, uh, that line, now, we're using cell phones, we're using uh, mobile uh, technologies where basically everything is unencrypted. We're using microwaves where basically everything is unencrypted. We're using operating systems that crash all the time. We're using stuff that is not very robust, it's not very secure, it's not very reliable, it's not very fault tolerant. And we're trying to build very robust, very reliable, safe, highly survivable systems. We got a problem. We can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, in principle. Now, in fact, there's some research on making silk purses out of sow's ears. Uh, there's some work by uh, von Neumann and uh, uh, Hemming's old uh, colleagues, my old colleagues, Shannon and Moore. Um, who showed basically that you can make an arbitrarily reliable system out of arbitrarily unreliable components as long as the probability of unreliability is not exactly one half. You take a, a box of relays in the old uh, uh, Moore-Shannon paper 
and uh, you can test them all. If they fail 90% of the time, you invert the logic. And now they only fail 10% of the time. If they fail 90% of the time, 10% uh, of the time, you accept them as, as good relays. If they fail exactly 50% of the time, you throw them out. And now using simple probabilistic arguments to show how you can build arbitrarily reliable systems out of those compounds. So in some sense, you can make a silk burst out of this house. There's also all this stuff known as Byzantine agreement, where you can take uh, something like, uh, let's say, four clocks, one of which is not only failing, but is failing maliciously, where it reports different results to its neighbors. Uh, you try to do this with three clocks, it doesn't work. You can't vote two out of three or, or take the middle value of the three clocks if one of the clocks is malicious. So the Byzantine theories assume absolutely nothing about the component failure. A component can fail absolutely arbitrarily in any way. And the Byzantine results show things like uh, if you have uh, 3k plus 1 uh, components, you can tolerate arbitrary misbehavior in any k. So in that sense, you can build one silk purse out of 3k plus 1 sousiers, if at most k of the sousiers are soused. Um, the results from the um, research community, however, generally apply only at the small. The question is what happens when we're dealing with very large, very real systems? And the answer is that most of the research breaks down. Most of the analytical techniques break down. And so one of the big challenges that I will throw before you today is how do you do things in such a way that when you compose the subsystems, you get something predictable out of the results? And as I said, there's some nice research in this area in the small. There's very little in the large. So the basic challenge that, that I want to leave you with is this difficulty of, uh, of putting together very large systems that will predictably do what they're supposed to do. Um, not only when they are first deployed, but forever after. And we have, we have the case of the telephone switch, which had gone through, the new, the new software had gone through very detailed testing. They discovered a button, which seemed to require a three or a four line catch. So you're only going to change three or four lines. Why bother go back to the six-month cycle to do all the testing and everything else? The three-line three patch is obviously going to work. Sure. You put it in and you wind up uh, blowing uh, telephone service all over the country very quickly, very easily. Nothing to it. So the problem is not just one of, of having good requirements to start with or having a good design that's consistent with our good requirements, or having good code that's consistent with your good specifications. It's ensuring in some way that everything you do from then on doesn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. And one of the key problems here has been the maintenance problem. The maintenance guys don't live by the same rules. They don't necessarily understand the requirements survival whatever else. And they figure, oh see I can I can stick in a two line patch that will do that. Experience shows that very often when you put in a small patch, you introduce new bugs. So again, we have to look at the system in the large. And what that means basically is that we have to radically alter our thinking. Now, the question frequently comes up, what are the easy things you can do? I've made it sound very hard. It's a difficult problem. The software engineering stuff works sometimes, but it's not very well applied. Uh, most of the systems aren't secure. Most of them aren't reliable. Most of them aren't highly available. How are we going to build robust stuff? What can we do to make this all work? Well, if 
If I just look at the security problem, with all these fixed passwords flying around the internet, unencrypted, uh, it would make sense, I think, to start using token authenticators, one-time passwords, cryptographically generated authenticators. There's, there's a lot of around now. Uh, it's very easy to do. I, I use an S key thing that uh, it has no technology at all. It's a list of uh, pseudo-randomly generated key phrases. And uh, the system prompts you and asks you for one And unless somebody steals your piece of paper, there's no way of breaking that because the list isn't stored in the computer. You check it, so it's a one, one way algorithm. Um, works fine, requires no technology at all. On the other hand, some of the cryptographic authenticators require smart cards and stuff like that. So if we had meaningful authentication, a large number of the security problems would vanish. We still wouldn't have touched some of the denial of service problems. The, the ability to bring down a node in the network by flooding it with a bunch of bogus packets, for example. That does not require any authentication. We also have the problem that most of the authorization are sort of black and white, all or nothing. Either you're in or you're out. Once you're in, you've got access to everything. Uh, there should be much more uh, incremental or, or differential um, access controls. If we had those, I think um, some of the problems would be made easier, but not all. And, and uh, that only goes a little bit of the way. In a system that has a super user mechanism where essentially anybody can become a super user with nothing to do at all, uh, all bets are off. The idea that you build a secure platform out of something like that, or even a reliable platform where your underlying infrastructure is not secure, uh, is very difficult. Now, another thing I think that, that is fundamental to this process is the, the education. And I think uh, Cynthia has a, a strong view of some of the things I'm talking about. And as far as I can make out, and this particular institution has a much stronger view on what it means to understand the system in the large than most of the universities in this country and around the world as well. Uh, it is very important that the educational process recognize the need for systems in an integrative way. Uh, there's a traditional battle between the, the systems engineers guys who don't know anything about computers, but know a lot about building bridges or whatever else, uh, control systems. And the computer folks who don't know much about the applications. And I suggest that there's a, a great need for elevating the educational process to encompass both. So one of the, one of the challenges here <coughs> is not only in having a system-oriented view of computer systems, but of the application system in the large, whether it's a medical health system or a, uh, a therapeutic radiation device or uh, uh, air traffic control system social security system, um, it's a system in the large. And it includes a lot of people. And the missing element in most of the educational processes to devote themselves to software engineering, programming languages, hardware engineering, are the people. Unless you can understand all of the fault modes that people can go into, there's no way you can So I think part of this educational process and part of the development process has to recognize much more carefully what people are capable of doing and what they're not capable of doing and when it's a mistake to have to trust people to do things that either they don't want to do or they can't do or that they're not
they're not going to do it because they've been bribed or, or they're incompetent or whatever else. So there's a very serious element of factoring the human being into the system. And I think that also is a major step forward if we, if we could somehow get that into the educational process. Research, of course, is also a huge element of this. Um, I think it's very difficult to, uh, to not be doing far out research that has a serious likelihood of someday being useful. Uh, if we cut that pipeline, it takes years to overcome the absence of that research. There's stuff that was going on in our lab 20 years ago that's beginning to fly, fly by Mars system today uh, in real aircraft. And it takes a long time for that kind of new technology to find its way into real system. So the challenges then are, are manifold. It's research and education and development. And understanding what the risks are. Um, I commend to you my, my, what you might call the horror list, the illustrious risks thing. And I um, hope that you will pull that off my webpage. There's a bunch of other stuff on my webpage. There's a, uh, a thing I did for the Senate back in June last year on essentially risks in the infrastructure and what we can do about it. That's also on the same website. And so it might be interesting for those of you who have had access, I hope all of you do, uh, to, uh, to browse on that uh, website and see what you can find. So um, it's about time for me to stop. Uh, can we take questions? Is that uh, possible with the camera? They're supposed to come up here and. Uh... Same way as you always do. It's a very vital question, I think. The, uh, the better mousetrap theory doesn't seem to work. Uh, there's some pretty bad mousetraps out there that uh, keep on, uh, you keep getting your fingers caught in when you try to set them. And uh, they're going to be here for a long time. Look at COBOL and Fortran, which are still here after years and years and years. Uh, the stuff tends to uh, have a life of its own. I think the the forcing function is going to be digital commerce. Forget about military needs, forget about government databases and all that stuff. Um, in order to do digital commerce a sane way, you need good crypto. You need some sort of non-defeatable uh, smart card that, does, that is resistant to some of the simpler attacks, like the Los Anderson attack, we just tricked it into spilling its keys. Uh, but also, perhaps resistant to some of these more sophisticated interference attacks. Because when you start putting billions of dollars into electronic commerce, uh, you're going to find organized crime has a great incentive, for example. Or your competition has a great incentive to wipe you out. You know, they can make you go out of business. Um, they might do so. Maybe it's illegal, but maybe it's undetectable. I haven't even talked about some of the issues relating to how do you detect what's going on. We're, we're doing a lot of research in our lab for the past 13 years and banging on that problem as well. Um, so here we are with, with um, systems that, in a sense, cannot be secured adequately. And we're using them in digital commerce. And people are worried about is it safe to give my social security number? Or is it safe to give my credit card number over the internet? Well, it's not 
safe to do a lot of things on the internet. If your life depends on it, for example. Um, if you're using open phone lines on a cell phone. And whether it's illegal or not to tap those phones is irrelevant. There are a lot of folks out there with scanners who are routinely scanning, as Newt Gingrich found out. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a problem. But I, I think when it comes to organized crime, uh, being able to attack systems systematically, the, the, uh, the Russian mafia tends to be pretty aggressive these days, uh, ignoring our own domestic situation. Uh, when international organizations can effectively drain a financial system and bring it to six fees. I think at that point, a lot of people will say, hey, you know, we better make some of this stuff more secure. But unfortunately, the, the defense needs don't seem to make much difference. They have driven the vendors into doing anything useful in the past 15 years. Um, the customers in general, the customer base doesn't And so the answer, the long, the short answer to your question, trying to get to it, is that we're stuck with a lot of bad stuff. And if you try to use it in critical situations, it's going to be a huge mistake. If you're just playing around at home in your own system and you don't have any diskettes that you carry in elsewhere, and you're not on the internet, yeah, it's okay. The question is, what are you trying to do with this system? So there are lots of applications where it doesn't matter. But if you're trying to do something critical, you better be careful. Uh, there was another question over here. Yes. yes. Uh, sir, what is the, uh, the best approach to assuring trust between two processes communicating over a network? Are we looking to some type of certification for some authority? Well, yeah. Um, the best solution is the one they used in, in the pyramids, which was to bury the, uh, the implementers and the designers inside the pyramids. That doesn't work either. That's security by obscurity. <laughs> now, unfortunately, everything is security by obscurity. Even though we say that's a bad thing, we shouldn't do that. You've got a bunch of crypto keys buried in the system somewhere. What do you do? You hide them. How do you hide them? Well, maybe you encrypt them. What key do you encrypt them with? Well, you got another key. You hide them. So you wind up with a bunch of digital stuff which is ultimately vulnerable. And the idea that you can hide this just doesn't work. So when you start to secure the networks, you're going to need, you're going to need token authenticators, you're going to need public key, uh, crypto, good crypto, not, not uh, cheesy stuff with short keys. You're going to need certificate services. How do you trust the certificate service? You use certificates, right? It's the same thing. It's just pushing the problem down one layer and having to trust the underlying mechanism. This is the paradigm we're facing. We push it down one layer and we trust what's underneath. The correct paradigm is trustworthiness, not trust. And the idea of trusting something that is intrinsically untrustworthy is unfortunately where we're at today. And this, this is perhaps the, the real root of our problem. Excited. We've known about this problem for as long as there were computers. Back in, uh, in the Baltics days, in, in 1965, uh, uh, we, we chose um, microseconds since 1901 in a 36-bit field. Well, you know, sooner or later that's going to expire. we got a problem. Uh, any two-digit rep representation is going to expire in the year 2000. Um, I hope you saw my uh, April Fool's issue of uh, the Risks Forum <coughs> two days ago. There's a couple of, there's a very nice solution to that problem uh, from the French, which I won't uh, tell you about. I hope so you go back and read it. This is Comp. Risks, uh, volume 19, issue number one. Um, this is a problem that we've known about for a long time. The number of folks who are willing to admit that it was a 
folks who said, well, yeah, our, our system is not going to release the fire until 2048. But by then, our system won't be around anymore. And who cares? I mentioned the COBOL and, and Fortran saga. Uh, stuff tends to perpetuate itself. And some of the algorithms tend to perpetuate themselves. The leap year problem is another example closely related to the year 2000. Where vast misunderstanding of, of whether the year 2000 is leap year or not, which is astounding because this has been discussed for years and years and years. It's in the book. It's, uh, you know, the book is new. Oh, yes, that's right. Um, but in, in the past 20 years, over the, over the history of, of my software engineering and other stuff, this problem has come up over and over again. So. The reality is that there are a great many systems that will be affected in the year 2000 in ways that nobody is able to analyze. There are a lot of COBOL programmers who didn't want to use dedicated reserved words, so they create their own variables to handle calendars. There's no easy way of identifying all of 